Good evening. We will start our uh, Board of Education meeting for Wednesday, April 29th, 2020, uh, with the oath of office for Mrs. Linda Witkowski and Mr. Alan Alexandrovich. So if you'd like to go to the front with our clerk, Mrs. Larson. No, just distance yourselves. Oh, you guys, <laughs> please raise your right hand. I believe you've asked your name. Do you, Linda Witkowski? Wait, I don't know. Oh, you don't. No, did she raise her hand? She, she just says, I do or I will. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Do you, Linda Witkowski, having been elected to the office of school board member, swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution? and will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of said office to the best of your ability. So help you God, I do. <laughs> do you, Alan Alexandrovich, having been elected to the office of school board member, swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin, and will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of said office to the best of your ability. So help you God. Congratulations and thank you, Mrs. Larson. Okay. So I'd like to call the board meeting to order. And if we could have a roll call, Mrs. Larson? Yes. Mr. Gamble? Present. Mr. Alexandrovich? Here. Mrs. Evans? Here. Mr. Sprague? Here. Mrs. Witkowski? Here. Mr. Lewis? Here. We are all present. Thank you. And the meeting has been properly posted. Please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Item four is approval of the agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Motion by Mrs. Witkowski. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Lewis. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, item five, we have a required public hearing. Um, first, I'd like to ask um, Mrs. Larson, board clerk, to if she could read the um, notice of the hearing. Thank you. <clears throat> Notice is hereby given that pursuant to Wisconsin State Statute 118.38 sub 1 sub B, the Franklin Public School District will hold a public hearing regarding a request for waiver of required instructional hours for the 2019-2020 school year due to the ongoing COVID-19 public health emergency. The public hearing will be held at the Education and Community Center, 8255 West Forest Hill Avenue, Franklin, Wisconsin, on the 29th day of April, 2020, at 6 o'clock p.m. Thank you. And uh, so we are in, in the public hearing. The hearing is for the community. Uh, board members can speak during the agenda item. I'll now ask Dr. Miller to give some information on uh, the um, instructional waiver. On March 13, 2020, Governor Tony Evers directed all public and private schools to close no later than March 18 to so slow the spread of COVID-19. Consequently, the Franklin Public School District closed its physical school buildings on Friday, March 13th and transitioned to virtual distance learning on Monday, March 16th. Virtual learning has occurred on every scheduled school day since and will continue through the regularly scheduled last day of school, which is June 9th, 2020. The Department of Public Instruction requires a minimum number of annual instruction, instructional hours, 437 for kindergarten, 1,050 for grades one through six, and 1,137 for grades seven through 12. While Franklin Public Schools has and will consistently <coughs> provide education virtually during the state mandated school closure, 
accurate accounting for instructional hours for 4,729 students each day is not practical. Therefore, the Board of Education is holding this hearing in satisfaction of Wisconsin Statute 118.38 sub 1 sub b concerning requests for waivers and in compliance with Wisconsin Statute 118.38 sub 1 and sub 1 m the Board of Education hereby directs the district administrator or his or her designee to apply on behalf of the board to the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction for the waiver of the requirements of Wisconsin Statute 121.02 sub 1 sub f and the administrative rules promulgated by the department regarding required instructional hours for students for the 2019-2020 school year only due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. Thank you, Dr. Miller. And now it is time for the public to speak. We do not have anyone present um, in person. I do have one email comment from a citizen, which I will now read in its entirety. My name is Nicole Salowitz, and my address is 8248 South Shadwell Circle. I urge the Board of Education to not request a waiver for the number of instructional hours for the 2019-2020 school year. I am a working mother of two and my oldest child is in first grade at Countrydale Elementary School. While a reduction in the number of instructional hours would be much easier for parents and teachers alike, I feel that it is in the best interest of our children to receive their full planned curriculum. The school closure has already resulted in a dramatic setback in the quality of my daughter's education. I've been trying to implement her lesson plans at home. However, I do not have any training in elementary education and the responsibilities of my full-time job do not allow me to spend appropriate time on her education. While my daughter is used to a seven hour day at Country Dale, she now receives only 30 minutes of face time with one of her teachers and she completes the provided lesson plan after less than three hours. Technically, this counts as a full day, but in reality, she has already experienced a dramatic reduction in the number of instructional hours. Why are her days so short? Many of the original lesson plan activities were not feasible in a virtual environment, and her teachers have been unable to find an alternate activity. For example, my daughter has not received any training in science and social studies since the school closure began six weeks ago. I realize that these are challenging times for everyone, but as a concerned parent, I urge you to not waive the number of instructional hours. Our children need all the help they can get in order to feel stimulated in these times of isolation. We need to continue the planned curriculum in order to foster their love of learning. It breaks my heart that my daughter is no longer receiving the engaging education in which she has been thriving. Please keep our ch children's best interest at heart while making this important decision. Uh, that is the only comment I received uh, by email. Um, so therefore, seeing no one else in attendance to provide a comment, I will now close the hearing. And uh, we will now move on to item six, the election of the 2021 board officers. Uh, I'll first give some background for the election. We've all participated in. Can I, can I ask a question before we move on to the next item? Yes. So we're automatically going to ask for the waiver? No, we have or an agenda item. Is there an agenda? I missed second. that. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so um, as you might remember, this is the only time um, for a board member that we can have a secret vote if it should come up. So um, what happens is we will, um, you can nominate anyone for a board office. There does not have to be a second. Without objection, um, if there is only one nomination, we will do a voice vote unless a board member objects to that. Um, if there is um, more than one nomination. Uh, you have paper ballots in front of you for each office. Um, those will be secret ballots and um, Lisa will come around and collect those and um, 
please use the black pen provide, I think it's black, the pen provided, bold your ballot when she comes around to collect it. And um, I think that's it, any questions? Okay, then with that, I am looking for a nomination for president. Do I hear a nomination? I nominate Janet Evans for president. Okay, I, I have a nomination for Janet Evans for president. Do I hear any other nominations? Any other nominations? And I'll ask one third time, is there any other nomination? And then with that, I'll close nominations for president. All those in favor of Janet Evans for president say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Then I am president, thank you very much. I'm looking for nominations for vice president. Do I have a nomination? I'll nominate Linda Witkowski. Okay, we have a nomination for Linda Witkowski for vice president. Are there any other nominations for vice president? Any other nominations for vice president? Any other nominations for vice president? Then with that, I'll close nominations. All those in favor of Linda Witkowski for vice president, say aye. 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 Opposed? It, uh, that carries, then Linda is vice president. Congratulations. I'm looking for a nomination for treasurer. Do I hear a nomination? I'd like to nominate Alan, uh, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> she still can't say. Okay, we have a nomination for Alan Elizondrovich for. I want to take back my nomination. <laughs> <laughs> for treasurer. You don't want me to murder your name, do you? <laughs> okay. Um, are there any other nominations for treasurer? Any other nominations for treasurer? And are there any other nominations for treasurer? Hearing none, all those in favor of Alan Alexandrovich for treasurer say aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations, Alan, you are treasurer. And I'm looking for a nomination for clerk. Do you have a nomination for clerk? I'll nominate Debbie Larson. We have a nomination for Debbie Larson for clerk. Are there any other nominations for clerk? Any other nominations for clerk? Any other nominations? All those in favor of Debbie Larson for clerk say aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations, Debbie, you are clerk. Congratulations, everyone. Okay, item seven. We have community comment. Um, we have no community here, so we will move on to item eight, consent agenda. Is there any board member who would like to remove an item from the consent agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor, I need a motion, please, to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Motion by Mr. Sprague. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Gamble. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, item 8B, oh, I'm sorry, item 9, school board announcements. Do we have any announcements? Um, I just have one. I will be um, emailing, instead of handing out paper copies, um, liaison and si assignment requests, um, and they will have a fillable uh, form on that that Lisa created um, so that you can hand back those, I mean, send back those requests. And then I'm also, I'll also be um, sending an email uh, seeing if anyone is interested in being on a, a handbook committee this year and a self board self evaluation committee this year. It's just good every couple of years to go over those two things. Any other announcements? All right, hearing none. The school board calendar, item 10. We have a regular board of education meeting Wednesday, May 6, 2020, here at the ECC, or also virtually if you so choose, at 6 o'clock p.m. Also a regular board of education meeting Wednesday, May 20th, here at the ECC, and also virtually if you should choose so. Item 11, reports, presentations, and other school board business, 11A. Approval to request a waiver of hours of instruction for the 2019-20 school year. And this is an action item. Uh, Dr. Miller did read her, her explanation of the waiver and we had one comment. Does the board have any questions for Dr. Miller or any comments? Yeah, I guess I have a question. If we don't request the waiver, what would the plan be? 
<clears throat> the reason we do request the waiver is so that we don't uh, receive sanctions from the Department of Public Instruction, which could be tied to funding. So we're required to provide a certain number of hours of instruction every year, and if you don't, you could be sanctioned uh, by the department. Okay, but uh, that wasn't my question. My mm -hmm. question was, if we didn't request it and if we don't go ahead and approve it, what would our plan be? I'm not to, certain. To make up those mean. hours. I mean, because if they're truly, if the, if the teachers are really online with the kids a half hour a day, mm -hmm. and then the children are, or students, I should say, are completing that work in three hours, mm -hmm. um, and that's a first grader. Now, I don't know what it is for the other grades. Now, I did talk to a couple neighbors and, and they were you know they have told me that yes there is some time being spent but not a whole lot mm -hmm. and they were also concerned about falling behind if we talked about starting the, the next school year earlier or mm -hmm. anything like that to make up some of the hours and some of the instruction for all these kids who are missing out so um, it would not be our position that they're necessarily missing out we have a very quality virtual program in place for our students and um, essentially it would be incredibly difficult to determine um, what hours were missed to make up. Um, I have the directors present at this meeting so um, I'm going to defer to uh, Dr. Reuter or um, Ms. Cody or Dr. Cohn. Um, would any of you like to respond to Mr. Lewis's uh, questions and comments? Uh, yeah, this, hi everyone, this is Dr. Reuter, um, virtually talking to you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Lewis, regarding your question, we prioritize essential learning at the elementary level, um, and I think the question in hand this evening from the email that was sent um, is, is primarily regarding elementary. I can speak to middle and high that um, we are on pace with probably close to, if um, in some cases, above the instructional hours that take place during a school day. To say that instruction takes place for a full seven hours at the elementary level is probably not accurate. The school day is eight hours, but with transition, lunch, um, other time throughout the day, we, we look at the total number of minutes that Dr. Miller laid out. Um, we've prioritized the essential um, learning that needs to occur for the remainder of the school year related to um, literacy and math, which are our accountability measures. And we're confident that how we've prioritized, we're going to meet um, the expectations of teaching all of those standards for the remainder of the year. And then from an encore perspective, which is statutorily required at the elementary level, um, we've built out plans for the remainder of the year. So the school day may be seen shorter for some students that may complete in two to three hours and others that may take longer, which is um, difficult to differentiate in this virtual environment as our teachers have done a phenomenal job of engaging and developing in less than 48 hours a online virtual community um, from the front end where we were just pushing out content to now where we have more interactive um, platforms through Google Classroom where we're meeting with kids face to face now. Um, we're able to provide feedback more in depth around um, assessments that we're administering through both math and literacy. So it's not ideal right now but nothing is obviously ideal in our new world we're living in. Question. So how is it measured now? You, I mean, you, you have this requirement and we're meeting it, but how do we demonstrate that we're meeting it? Is it just by providing our schedule, our class schedule? Or? So the, the waiver um, waives like the exact number of hours that are required, but in a, in a normal school year, okay. yes, we count the number of hours that our students have seat time in our schools. That's what the hours are. Based on the schedule? It's based on our schedule that we have in place for our students. For example, uh, we well exceed that number at the elementary level because of a way that our day is scheduled and the time in which children are present in school. We well exceed it actually at the middle school. It's the high school where it's the tightest in terms of getting to that um, 1137. We have to be careful. More than two snow days, then we're making up time. Is there any way that we 
you know, if I wanted to observe a class or, or, or participate in it, not participate, but just kind of mm -hmm. silently watch a class, is there a way to do that, whether it be a middle school or a yeah, high school class? We'd probably have to um, obtain consent from some parents if it were younger children, most definitely. Um, well, no, 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 not, not sit with them, but I mean just like they log on and hear their teacher. Is there some way I could do that? Um, I, I, Since it's virtual, I would think that I could somehow. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Reuter, if you want to respond to that, I mean the manner in which we're conducting instruction, it's uh, probably not entirely conducive to that, but I'm sure there are some yeah. things where well, it could occur. how do you occur. conduct instruction? I mean, we, Mr. Mr. Lewis, that. we could provide you what a elementary day would look like and the content and expectations around learning um, because we don't, it's not synchronous where it's a constant live feed between the teacher and all the students. There's expectations uh, around some independent work, some parent guided work based on the way instruction is built as well as um, face to face or small group and that varies obviously around the level of independence from a kindergartner to a 12th grader. So we could easily provide you what a day would look like um, at the various levels so you could see the amount of engagement students are being asked to. Um, like for a sixth grader or a, for someone like a sixth grader or a middle school or a high school student, are they logging in one-on-one -on -one with the teacher or is the teacher conducting say a class and several students are logging in at the same time? Yeah, that's a great question. It varies. So um, some teachers are building out where they have a whole class meeting where they set kind of the expectations for the day. Kids are given every day through email or Google Classroom or other online platforms the expectations for the day and the workload. There might be videos that are pre-recorded by teachers, like a tutorial that state, here's our intentions for the day, here's some resources, here's some predictable problems we want you to work through. Here are my office hours where I'm available to Google Hangout with you, which is a virtual one-on-one -on -one video conference, or a teacher might invite specific students or a small group of students for individual classroom instruction just like we would do in a regular setting but the workload and um, time requirements at the secondary level 6 through 12 are are pretty close to six to seven hours of independent and mixed practice with the teacher um, daily so it's still pretty rigorous when you think about a uh, middle and high school student um, a middle school student has on average seven classes a day, and a high school student has four, but rotates between an A-B schedule. So um, kids are engaged in all those classes. It's not like we've eliminated those, especially at the high school level. Um, the level of, of expectation we're trying to hold as high as possible, understanding that credit attainment is attached to that and the, and the um, ramifications beyond Franklin High School. So um, you might see more need at the elementary level we have every day as a child will see a video tutorial for reading writing a read aloud from their teacher and a math um, message that will kind of set the course of action for the day and then we're utilizing an on online platform called Zern where, it te where students work at a pace based on um, the standards we've articulated for the remainder of the year to um, watch a tutorial, better understand some direct instruction, and they're expected to apply that. Um, teachers are developing and deploying across the system at the elementary level mini lessons that are self-recorded YouTube videos they're creating, which they, they are mimicking the instruction they would provide in a mini lesson during um, the school day. And then from there, they've set up uh, appointment slots with all students they can check in with them on the progress of the expected outcomes from those mini lessons and then everyday kids at the elementary and throughout the system submit via their online platform uh, work samples and progress and teachers provide feedback and then they use that data from those work samples in one-on-one -on -one conferences or small meetings something that's taking hold very quickly at the elementary level is a constant morning meeting where teachers just pull their whole class into a google meeting and they sit with 25 kids in front of them and check in on their social emotional well-being but also set the intentions for the day identify any um, misunderstandings kids have and then kids engage in the videos that are um, provided for them that are record are not purchased and canned but recorded personally by their teachers that are again we try to mimic what would happen in the classroom in those short condensed mini lessons and then allow for the students to engage in the work independently and check in with them 
And I, I have provided the board the last five weeks a very, very concise example of what's happening. You've had grade one, you've had grade two, you've had grade six, you've had grade nine, and I will continue to do that. And if you, there's lots of links, There's you can go very deep in learning okay. about how this instruction is delivered, and I've been trying very hard to share that. As oh, far Chris, as being present, he gave yeah. a great explanation. I appreciate yeah. that, Chris. Thanks. As far as being present, I mean, I feel the same way. It's like I want to get in a classroom, but you have to remember these are the homes of mm -hmm. these children, and entering into those videos is a peculiar thing for a parent to see someone they don't know, right? Um, so you're literally entering their home when you show up in a video with the other children. You see what's going on in the background and everything else. So I, I too, have wanted to jump in. But no, no, that's not. Ex I, okay. I, I think I that's not exactly what I meant. I meant okay. to be able to see what the teacher is instructing, not, not what the Understood. kids are doing. Understood. Yeah. I would also just add that our, I, I think you know the email um, that expressed the concern. Our teachers are working together more than maybe they ever have. We have established before school our meetings um, twice a week where teachers every third and for an example every third grade teacher across the system is getting together to work with our literacy and math coaches and our elementary principals to really identify um, the essential neat elements of learning that will take place through the remainder of our school year and then how they can work together to be effective and efficient with the, the delivery of instruction in this new environment and that's that's happened since day one at the uh, middle and high school level because of the access kids had with Chromebooks. So there might be some good unintended or, or results coming from this. Exactly. Mm -hmm. good. Yeah, the silver lining in this is we're working together as a system better than we ever have. Good. Question. So, you know, in our traditional day, we have the school day that kind of defines the learning situation, right? The number of hours that children Right, but I'm saying that I go to school, the bell rings, I'm learning. The bell rings, I'm not learning. What's the equivalent in a virtual environment as far as the parameters of I start learning here, I'm done now? That, that happens in every individual home. So you have to keep in mind that the parents of these children are often working themselves while they're trying to educate their child. So they don't have a, an adult with them all day to guide their learning. So the 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 time could occur anytime. I heard about a young guy, a young child who gets up at 5:30 in the morning. He's a little eager beaver. But and the question working. is, how did we set those expectations, or how did we did we have an idea how it was going to work? We just said, you know, we'll see what happens. Linda, we had like three days to put no, this I'm together. Just saying so we right. certainly didn't just you know say we'll see what happens. There is a lot of people who put a lot of effort into very quickly putting together. A, uh, an amazing uh, um, virtual program and distance program for our students to get, to be doing what they should be doing. <clears throat> not busy work, not packets, not like off at PBS sites, just drifting. I mean, um, we made very conscious decisions and we continue to make conscious decisions about that alignment to our regular curriculum. Teachers meet um, regularly to discuss that. They meet by grade level. Principals are meeting with them all the time to ensure that we are definitely delivering the curriculum, definitely doing what's essential for that learning. We also, you know, I feel like I'm back to you, sorry. Um, we also have a number of personnel who have children in other schools. So we're learning a little bit about what's going on in other districts. And I can tell you, Franklin has a very, very good program compared to many and, and that's I'm not doubting that. I'm just, my question though is because the issue here is, the, you know, the hours of, we seem to be fixated mm -hmm. around, this is how we measure learning. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you thought about, you know, what is the equivalent of the school day in a virtual environment? Is there a master schedule that says, I will meet with these teachers here? You know, I, I'm, I'm finding, I'm a, had to transition to a virtual work environment. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding that everything has to be more scheduled, otherwise it doesn't happen. It absolutely does. And one of the samples I sent you, you could look at the middle school, you could see how every teacher puts on a schedule from the house what it is that the, the students need to work on and accomplish. So you're absolutely right. Things do need to be more structured, more scheduled. 
And they, they are, and teachers are scheduling it like any, but it's flexible apparently in every household. There's uh, Linda, some um, level of flexibility. I, I feel like I can I can help with this a little bit. So I have an eighth grader and a fifth grader. Um, they both get um, they both get a virtual agenda every day. Um, the agenda is is uh, I, visible to me and also to my daughters. Um, they have uh, it started out as math, um, writing, and reading. Um, very soon after that, um, uh, social studies was added. Um, there's um, there's also like uh, the gym teacher added something, and um, my daughter's in a uh, in a uh, cooking class. So that that sort of that sort of changed a little bit, and the personal finance is added. Um, so they get. There's been, I think the, the school district has done a very good job of reacting to, okay, let's get this out there to begin with. And then what are the questions we're getting from, what are the questions we're getting from families? And then let's react to those and work on that. Um, it's certainly not ideal, but my eighth grader is probably five online, five to six hours a day. Um, a couple of times a week she talks with a teacher. Um, oftentimes it's with, um, with one of her classmates, sometimes it's one-on-one. -on -one. Um, my fifth grader has a one-on-one -on -one with her teacher twice a week. Um, and she has, uh, there's a, a two or three times a week there's a check-in with the entire class or the entire class is invited. Um, I, I do feel like there's um, there's, there is an agenda, um, and if it's, um, especially for my older one, if it's not, if she doesn't have an assignment in, uh, we get a note saying this wasn't handed in. Um, and most things are handed in virtually even when they're in school. So that's, that's pretty similar um, in terms of, okay, this was, this was handed in or not handed in. Like if she has a math assignment, it gets handed in. Um, it, it it's rarely written out, so it it would be handed in via computer, via email, um, and it's and it's handed in the same way. Um, at this point, um, it's not ideal and it's not going to be ideal, but we're not going to be able to do it any other way. Um, and I think. Um, I think they've. I think that the uh, administration should be lauded for what they've done, what they've done so far. And I, I know. I know you're not saying that they shouldn't be, but um, I think it's it's going as well as it could be expected to go. I feel like. So an agenda primarily controls the day, mm -hmm. but there's no time frame around it. There's no, some there's assumptions not. around it, but not. I mean, there's the ones I've got. The ones I've seen. No, there's no agenda around it except for. Um, the the daily meeting for um, for the younger one uh, that's that that's at a time and and you have to join that live that you can't um, but every most other things can be scheduled um, or are ha hand this in by seven o'clock on the 29th for instance and you can't have an agenda when every family is different and they have their own life going on but right. uh, for me the concern is that we complete the school year you know and don't end early mm -hmm. and and then DPI is constantly coming up with uh, you know we're, we're, they're not going to make us have all the testing and they're just relaxing everything so I just think next year we're going to need some extra support for kids that are struggling from this year is and that smart not to have the testing um, to judge it, where they are and what, you know. Yeah, it, it would be really difficult to administer and proctor. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. okay. Um, Ms. Lukowski, I want to make sure your questions are answered. Um, um, Dr. Reuter, did you want to um, make any other comments um, being not here? Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I had a hard time hearing Ms. Lukowski's original question. Well, my question was, you know, in our current, in the uh, right when we're normal, we understand the school day starts 
the beginning and the end. So there's a bell on either side so you know what the parameters are of the school day. What's the equivalent in a virtual environment? And I've already heard that usually there's an, you did say there was an agenda that was put out, but there's no necessary time frames around it. Right. If they want to do math before they do, before they do reading, that's fine. So that's the only parameter that you're working with in the virtual environment is this agenda every day. And what's, um, I can flip this too and say, what's the parameters for the teacher? Are they, can they say, well, I want to start at nine and from here? Or is, did we establish any parameters going in? Yes, kind we, of we established a virtual school day, which is equivalent to what the current teacher school day is for teachers. So the expectation around that time at every level is to um, make sure they're updating the virtual environment for the current day's learning with those intentions that Dr. Miller has shared examples with at each level, as well as then, um, as Mr. Sprague gave a great example of his two children and how teachers are setting up times to meet with kids, have um, virtual office hours for specifically at the secondary level for kids to jump in um, to ask questions as they work independently. The, the most challenging aspect of virtual learning, and this isn't just because of COVID, this is prior and you look at the research is, um, you don't have an adult next to you that is your teacher, right? So if I, per, if I complete a task for the given day's learning at a faster rate than let's say my, my classmate, Dr. Miller, I'm done for the day. And that's where the time piece is very difficult to navigate because the teacher's not there to say, and your next step is, your next work is, or help confer or coach them to the next level of proficiency and competency. So where a parent might say, my child's done in three hours, a child that lives next door, it might take six hours. And that's where the, the, we have difficulty to help push each kid um, to, to have a standard set of minutes because in a face-to-face in a -face environment, a teacher is working directly with children all day and can see and react and respond. In a virtual environment, we're waiting for work submission, we're waiting for a parent contact, or we're waiting for those times that we've set up to meet with kids. So we've built the teacher day to replicate the expectations of the professional day for teachers in the regular face-to-face -face setting. Their workflow looks a little different from the standpoint of they've scheduled time throughout the day to meet with kids, to teach whole group lessons, to record lessons, and most importantly, to provide feedback in the virtual environment through our online platforms to help kids grow um, so that we are, we are successful at the launch of next year and feel confident that kids have, met, have made one year's growth in one year's time. And we have our limitations, but um, we, are, we are navigating that, working through it every day as a new engagement in how we can do this work better. And to Dr. Miller's point, we started very um, calculated and didn't try to do everything all at once. And as you've seen, we phased in at the elementary level, um, online learning or virtual learning so that parents could navigate this because we know that parents are still trying to be a parent, work, and now become a quasi teacher for their child, as well as we know that our teachers had to flip their whole mental model around how they instruct. So we were very conscious of understanding that at the elementary level because of kids not having one-to-one -one devices and living in that world every day. At the secondary level, middle and high and fifth grade, we were able to launch at a more rapid pace because we knew the kids' ability and technology level. So our plan has been scaffolded, but we feel it's been very successful thus far. We continue to refine as we get feedback and we administer assessments, our own local assessments, not standardized assessments and look at that data to better understand, okay, we will continue to make changes to our virtual environment, but we'll never waver from high expectations for all kids and all staff. Just one follow-up. I mean, when you started out, you talked about, you know, really the difference is there's not an adult right there and the kid kind of, the child might be waiting for the next step. But I'm wondering though, if we're not leveraging the technology to allow that child to pace is only going his own pace. It sounds like the teacher yeah. is still very much controlling the pace of each of the curriculum when I would hope that we can use technology in a different way. Not, it sounds like we're kind of like, I don't want to say paving a cow path, but we're kind of duplicating the, that teacher model using new tools when maybe the new tools allow us to do it differently. If they could, I mean, why couldn't this, the student continue? 
Yeah, so an example at the elementary level that you're um, speaking to, Ms. Wachowski, we are leveraging the ZERN platform, which is an online math program that aligns well with our Eureka curriculum because we don't want to fully sidetrack board approved curriculum and uh, the work that we've, we've put in place. So ZERN kids have the ability to work ahead. Um, so they can work ahead. However, we hold, we stop them at certain points for assessment check-ins because anyone can work ahead but not know what they're doing, right? You can plow through work, but you might not be hitting levels of proficiency at grade level or beyond. So kids have the ability to work ahead. Kids can read ahead. Kids can write ahead. Um, they can do the work ahead. However, we have to have checks and balances in place to make sure even though you're working ahead, you're still learning because it's very easy to get caught in the minutia of just submitting work, but if the quality of the work isn't at the expectation levels we have as a school district, working ahead is actually hurting the child. So I don't, I don't think we've limited that kids have to just be, I, I did my learning for the day and that's done, um, as well as the way we built our encore classes at the elementary level, um, they're long-term projects for kids, so they can work at the pace they want to complete those projects. And then um, you heard Mr. Sprague speak to the elective levels at the sec middle school, and it's very similar at the secondary, at the high school level, where it's it's daily work that's leading to project-based outcomes, um, and that's how we built all of our um, encore courses and elective courses at the secondary level. So I don't think we're limiting kids working ahead. It's just we have to navigate and understand that we don't want to just give kids tasks to stay busy. We want the intention to be learning so that next year when we come back, it's not, well, we did a lot of stuff, but no one learned anything. It's about learning. And so we have to be calculated just like we would in a face-to-face -face environment that what we're giving kids as far as a product to engage in every day is about learning and not just keeping their time busy. I, I would say that, um, you know, the support that the district has received, you know, and in terms of allowing us to purchase uh, technology positioned us in, in a really good place with our students so that every student, kindergarten through 12th grade, who needs one of those devices back there um, can have one. So it's something that you know, I think we can be really proud of. You can be proud of as a board that that was supported because mm -hmm. that is, to your point, Ms. Wachowski, is is very essential to this this environment. Mm -hmm. Without it, it's it's very difficult to engage children in what Dr. Reuter is describing, which is quality learning. It's it's tough. Are have there been or are there any engagement issues? So we are tracking submission uh, with our students, like what they're submitting to see who is and who is not engaged. And there's a slight decline at the high school, um, but not um, as bad as you would think. Um, it's, it's a very slight decline. So, and the middle school's doing fabulous. The engagement rate is very, very high there. And we're, we're tracking what kids are submitting to know that they're engaged. And we're using our support staff you know, our counselors and our psychologists and social workers and everyone's all hands on deck when, when a student isn't engaged. But frankly, there are some families, not many, that just said, I can't do this, we give up. You know, so we keep trying and we're working with them, um, so. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking for a motion to direct the district administrator or his or her designee to apply on behalf of the board to the Office of the mm -hmm. Superintendent for Public Instruction for the waiver of the requirements of Wisconsin Statute 121.02 sub 1 sub F and the administrative rules um, promulgated by the department regarding required instructional hours for students for the 2019-2020 school year only due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. Do I hear that motion? So, so moved. Mr. Gamble. Mr. Gamble uh, made the motion. Second? M Mrs. Second. Larson? Do, um, so we have a motion. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Mr. Alexandrovich? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Aye. Mr. Gamble? Aye. Mr. Sprague? Aye. I vote aye. Mr. Lewis? Aye. 
and Mrs. Witkowski. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Reuter. Okay. Um, now we will move on to item 11B, the designation of the district depository. This is an action item and um, recommended bank depository for 2020-21 is BMO Harris Bank. One of the tasks the board takes care of at the yearly reorganizational meeting is to reapprove the bank that the district uses. We are currently using BMO Harris Bank, $3.5 million, and are recommending that we continue using the bank. The district does not have a service contract with the bank. So um, I don't know if Mr. Milzer is on the phone, if there's any questions. I'm looking for a motion to approve BMO Harris Bank. What, what do we get from BMO Harris? I mean, for example, the library board, they just switched banks from BMO to uh, Waterstone, is that it? I don't remember, yeah. I apologize. Anyway, anyway, one, of, one of the things that, that they uh, brought up was that they made contributions uh, uh, to the library for different things. Does BMO make any kind of contributions to like the robotic or anything like that. What what do they do for us other than run checks? Um, Mr. Milzer? Uh, when we switched to BMO, uh, they did make some contributions. I don't know in the last year or two if they've uh, made contributions or have been approached to make contributions either for programs like you mentioned. I guess I'm not sure that's the basis for selecting a bank. Let me just say that. <laughs> BMO is also very expensive. Yeah, the fee structure would be my yeah, yeah, what, question. Yeah, what kind of fees do we pay? That, which is the reason that they switched to the library board. Because now we're not paying fees anymore where there they were. And where yeah. I was before, we were paying big fees on a monthly basis, and I couldn't get the company to change. The owner didn't want to do it. But I went out and priced it, and instead of paying six, $700 a month, we could have paid nothing. They didn't want to move. So they are expensive. Yeah, we switched from Chase Bank to BMO because their fees were less. Uh, we looked at U.S. Bank, who refused to give us any pricing at all. We worked with Johnson Bank, that was much more expensive than BMO for us. And uh, so BMO has been a, a, a good spot for us. Uh, we're pretty large in the amount of money that we have. Um, and they're able to handle that. They've provided very good service. We have dedicated client managers that have not changed every year uh, like they did uh, with Chase when we had them. And they do provide all of the services that we need. They're also in a good location for the people from our schools to be able to drive there and make direct deposits. Thank you, Mr. Milzer. Um. So I don't think I had a motion on that. I'm, I'm looking for a motion to approve BMO Harris as our district depository. So moved. Motion by Mrs. Larson. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Sprague. Any discussion on the motion? Oh, just Jim, can you just summarize briefly like what services we get from the bank and how much we pay? Uh, Mr. Milzer. Was there a question? Yes. Um, the question was um, what services we receive from the bank and then um, what do you... What kind of the fee? What are the fees? What are the fees? Much which I, I know you probably haven't prepared for this meeting, but if you could um, please respond. Uh, they hold all of our different uh, funds uh, in separate accounts, uh, such as our construction funds, our debt service funds, uh, our general fund, um, they provide all of our, our checking and so forth. They provide all of our wires and our ACH. Um, and they've worked with us on um, our, our internet presence with them, uh, which is also very secure. It's, it's something that we also look for um, in a bank and getting a, a large bank that has a good tech staff uh, so that we feel secure that our, our information uh, is not going to be tampered with. Uh, they also provide 
information on different programs we might want to implement. Some of them we have, some of them we haven't. Um, Can you give an example? Based on our operation um, versus maybe a, a business where it, it might be uh, might be more advantageous. I'm sorry, Mr. Kelsey. What you is mentioned the, different programs that they offer. What example of something that they offered that you considered or didn't? The question is what programs? Um, an example of a program, perhaps. Oh, uh, like a, they have a positive pay program uh, for ACH, uh, where you can send them uh, your checks, the checks you've issued, and they match them up. Uh, against checks that have come in, mm -hmm. uh, that's yeah. one of the the programs that. Uh, Is there a fee for uh, that? that? They offer to try and cut down on on fraud. Mm -hmm. Is there a fee for that, or? The question is: Is there a fee for that? Uh, there's a fee for that, some kind of a monthly fee. It, it, that one's not, it's not exorbitant, but they do have a fee for it. What do we pay per month for activity? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to look that up. But it's not offset by the credits for uh, money balances, is it? It's, um, you have to watch your balances to keep them in a range where you have uh, enough money that you're creating uh, an amount that fees can be drawn from, but not too much money uh, in there that, um, it becomes a liability for the bank. So it's something that we watch pretty much constantly on where we're at with our balance there so we keep it within range. Any credit cards? We get credit cards at the bank? Did you ask about a credit card? Yeah, do you have credit cards through the bank? We do not have credit cards through the bank, no. Okay, all right. Do they handle payroll dollars? Uh, they they handle um, they handle our payroll dollars, but they don't really do anything for payroll. Like they don't process it or anything like that. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. So all those in favor of BMO Harris as our um, district depository, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Milzer. Uh, next is the designation of the newspaper of record. I'm looking for a motion to accept the South Now Milwaukee Journal Sentinel newspapers as the district newspaper of record for 2020 2021. Do I hear that motion? So motion by Mr. Alexandrovich. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Sprague. Is there any discussion? Not a lot of choice. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any uh, interest in changing the law so we don't have to do this? Well, why don't we bring that up at SWSA? I think we should. <laughs> I think there was at one point some legislation involved changing public notices that are out there, but nothing on the horizon. Okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item 11D is the appointment of the CISA one annual convention delegate. Um, I've been that delegate for three years and I will volunteer again. If anyone else wants that nomination, you could speak up. Also, I've also been on the board of control as an off and as an officer and I would this year I would be up for nomination to do that again. So is, does anyone else want to volunteer? Okay, then I would have to have someone from the board nominate me in second. I nominate Thanks. you Mrs. Evans for the CISA one uh, annual convention delegate. Okay, so a nomination by Mrs. Larson and a second by Mr. Alexandrovich for me. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, all right, so we have 11E, the fall early college credit and start college now request approvals. Um, Mr. Volo. Uh, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? 
Good evening, yes. All right, so um, you had access to a memo that talked about and had the 39 applications that we had from students. The 30 ap 39 applications cover institutions ranging from UW Stout, UWM, MSOE, Marquette, Alberno, and MATC, and that's the early college credit for the four year universities and start college now program for MATC, the tech schools. In this case, we have students remember multiple applications can be submitted by one student. Students will submit multiple applications in order to make sure they can find a course that fits into their schedule because they cannot control the college schedule. So the courses you see before you and the application do not represent 39 different students, nor will all those classes be taken. For example, this spring we have 55 courses we approved, 16 are being taken by seven different students when we had nine apply. Last fall, we had 32 courses approved, eight were taken by seven students out of 10 applicants. So as we look at these applications, we must consider them on their merits in terms of do we offer a comparable course or not at high school? That's the first starting point for the early college credit or start college now program. In this case, there were several students who exceeded the math that we offer through Franklin High School. That's Calculus BC, which is the equivalent of Calculus 1 and 2, which is why you saw the large number of calculus requests. Several of those students also requested Calculus 1 and 2, uh, which we would deny because, one, the students already had the course, and two, we do offer a comparable course. So what you see is the courses that we do not offer an equivalent of that would apply to those students, whether it's as elective credit or as continuation of their learning, and the ones that are denied are courses we offer an equivalent of. So I kindly submit those for any questions or comment or consideration for approval. What is it with the UW Stout classes? <laughs> Uh, UW Stout, so Early College Credit now has the ability for students to access any online course. So the UW system can present those courses in any way, shape, or form. And UW Stout is actually a culinary pathway or hospitality pathway that's not really offered at a lot of UW areas that are closer to us. So it's kind of unique, kind of a first, but the student who really knows what they want to do and found the courses that they think give them that leg up at the university level. So. They're probably really well intentioned in terms of knowing what you know and why. So UW Stout has exactly what they want to do. So it's a student who knows where they're going after high school and is really trying to maximize that opportunity. Great, thanks. Yep. Are these generally seniors or, or what? Uh, so the early college credit program can come from grades nine through twelve. Uh, in this case, most of the students will be upperclassmen. That's not all. So depending on the different programs and the students, um, there's a couple of students who are underclassmen. Most of the students will be juniors or seniors. And transportation is obviously, if they're doing a course in person, uh, a challenge for underclassmen to get to those universities if they're not doing an online class. But they have to be accepted into the university? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Do they have to be accepted into the university? Yep. So the university will have their own requirements. So for example, if a student requested uh, differential equations, which would be a math class beyond Calculus 2, if the student has not satisfied the Calculus 2 requirements, the university would say, I'm sorry, you can't be in differential equations. Uh, that's an example. So the students have to prove their you know, place in that university. So once we approve it, the student then is in their court to work with the university to make sure that they get in the course they want and the university would look at if they have the prerequisites that they demand in order to seat them in the class. I mean, there's a class prerequisite, but I'm talking about, don't they have to be an admitted student? I mean, you apply to college. It, it, they don't apply to the school as typical undergrads. It's a special student circumstance based on the early college credit or start college program in the state that allows students to take, you know, these courses, you know, course by course. They cannot be a start college now and early college credit student at the same time. However, they're not a typical undergrad, so they're not admitted to UW, Scout, or Milwaukee, or Marquette, or MATC as a full-time student. And that's the program from the state that allows them to do that as still K-12 education works. Are there more requests this year than normal? It just seems like a longer list for some reason. It is a bigger list than we had this past spring or this past fall. Uh, but what I'd 
point out is of those 39 different applications represents 24 students and of those applications that you see 75 applications come from a total of seven students so in many of the cases when you see a course repeated across different universities that again is a student covering their bases and making sure that they're proactively whether they can take it at marquette msoe uwm they're actually putting in four different applications for us which we then consider case by case application by application because they must submit one for each university they're considering and again that's to cover their own way to make sure they find a course that fits in their course schedule for next year okay cool and then i did ask a question about the cost i know jim you indicated we spent ten thousand on the previous semester is yep, there so i think uh, up until this point we had spent about ten thousand dollars and that covered 24 courses and about 84 credits uh, thus far through 19 and 20. So that would go back to, I believe, a couple of summer courses from summer of 2019 through our current spring semester and the bills we've had so far. Is there state funding for this? I think the question was state funding. So there's a reimbursement pot that we would get back 25% of you know, reimbursement for a course that we approve that does not fulfill, you know, something that we have or excuse me, goes beyond something we have and fulfills and applies to a student's uh, credit total for their high school graduation. So 25% is a state reimbursement uh, that we can get for those courses. And I believe that's like many state programs, there's a large pot of money and that gets, you know, parsed out to the state based on the number of requests. Uh, that the state gets. I don't think the amount varies based on year to year. I think they set an amount and then schools access it. So we should get 25%. Um, I can't tell you whether or not, you know, we get exactly that year to year. But it, with course, courses required to be part of their graduation requirements, is what you're saying? It's meeting a, re sorry. It's meeting a graduation requirement, a high school graduation requirement, is that what you're saying? So if a course, if we would not apply it to a student's graduation plan, which in that case, we have elective credits, students earn up to 32 credits while they're high school students. So if there is a reason we would not apply it to the student's you know, graduation plan, if it would not fit anywhere within their career pathway or you know, academic career planning pathway, that's another you know, option for courses. Uh, typically courses, because we have so many diverse electives and courses kids can take and pathways kids can explore. Most every course will fulfill a graduation requirement, if anything, an elective requirement. So in that case, uh, it would be a graduation component that fits into their bigger plan. And again, if we don't have a comparable course, we would get reimbursed again at 25% by the state. If a student took it for college credit only and we did not have a comparable course, there'd be a different reimbursement from the state and there'd be some pay from the pupil but again, that doesn't apply to any of these courses. It just seems to me that um, our local tax dollars might be used to benefit a broader group of kids than just the small numbers. I'm just gonna say that and we can vote. Okay, I'm looking for a motion to approve the fall early college credit and start college now request. Do I hear that motion? So moved. Motion by Mrs. Larson, is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Gamble. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Vola. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Be well. You too. Uh, next is uh, item 11F, board retreat planning. Um, tonight, this is just um, a very short item. Uh, we usually do this at this meeting where uh, we just say that we are going to have a retreat in the future. Um, we uh, need to know, just think about how many retreats we would like to have and whether we want, it on, want them on um, weekdays or weekends. And um, we need, because this year we didn't get to go over our board self-evaluation, we need to think about having one to do that and we need to go over our goals and then uh, you know we could think about having um, a, a facilitator come and talk about board development or you know whatever the board wants so the first step would be to um, send out like one of those doodles to see um, 
what dates are, avail are available and, but first, um, the first thing would be, do you want to go like for two weeknights like we have been doing? Um, and then I think we were talking about, because you always, you like us to do this after you have your mm -hmm. administrators, um, their, is it their retreats or, or their, your um, goals? It's your goals. Right. So is that, uh, could we do one in August and one in July, or do, could we do, um, do they have to both be in August, or? Um, you said July. July. Yeah. Could, um, could we do end of July? Um, you could do the, the uh, review of your goals for the year and the self eval, most definitely the end of July, and then okay. something, something a in August later to set your new goals. I think yeah. would make sense. Okay. So would you want to aim for weeknights? I prefer weeknights. Weeknights? Mm -hmm. Weeknights? Okay. So if we sent out a doodle to ask what's available, that would be our first step. And then maybe uh, asking after that, ask for some ideas um, for like a second retreat. But the first step would be to go over self-evaluation and things like that. So is that okay if we send out the doodle? Okay. For weeknights. Okay. All right. So that... That was just a short item. And then uh, item 11G, the treasurer's report, is available in the board docs library. And uh, 12, school board meeting debriefing. Um, I just want to say welcome back, Mr. Alexandrovich. And, uh, <laughs> and congratulations, Linda, also. Thanks. I don't know if anyone else has comments. Um, for the meeting, okay. Uh, one, um, perhaps clarification. Um, the um, Dr. Miller, your um, keeping you informed last week um, talked about the uh, educational foundation and the signs, um, and how the educational foundation paid for them, which um, in the in the meeting for the educational foundation we did vote to pay for them but it's my understanding that we're not that the educational foundation is not paying for them i hadn't heard that I so i don't that. they were already paid for by some other by some other way and i, I don't yeah mr volo do you are you still there i, I don't think he i, don't I think, think he he's there um, I, i'll have to find out about that i i had I've been under the impression that they were paid for by the foundation. I'm looking for my email that from Mrs. Cordani. Okay. Uh, maybe. Um, and I'm not sure it's even yeah. necessary. At this it, point. It's, it's really not an agenda, a board meeting yeah. thing, but it, it, that's important to clarify. So if you want to um, send an email, I will, I will you can even copy in the board on that because mm -hmm. it's not. Um, Board business. Sure. So, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Future agenda items. Um, board retreat discussion. Then we'll we'll have that at our next meeting to talk about what. Uh, if anybody has ideas or anything like that, um, I'll I'll email you on that. And then uh, the 2020, 2021 staffing report will be on May 20th. Um, and then I'm looking for a motion. Can I add oh. some other maybe a request? Uh, given, I, I think we heard, we had a good discussion on how this online learning is happening and we have some idea. Can we also get some report on the financial side of things? So buildings are closed, you know, buses aren't running and kind of what we, what's going on on that side of the picture? Um, you mean for a meeting? Um, uh, I think as an agenda item, so a well, report? We're trying not to have agenda items that might bring the public here right now. Um, I yeah. think this is a good agenda item. I it think it that would might be, be a very good agenda item. But if it might draw the public, that's what we're trying not to do. So absolutely is an important discussion, and we're continuing to gather information as, as we receive it about what's going to be required in terms of reporting to the Department of Public Instruction regarding um, how this has impacted districts financially. We're also... Um, you know, really listening carefully to see if the federal government is going to put more money into education. 
uh, in my last keeping you informed, it did include that piece regarding the money that we, we are receiving, that's for certain, um, so you know what that is. Um, I know Mr. Milzer has plans when he brings the budget to um, convey to you um, what, what it, how it's been impacted and what we are thinking about the future um, with everything that's going on right now. So we, we spend a lot of time in meetings. Um, there's a lot of different uh, ways in which people are viewing their budge budget from the worst case scenario to the best case scenario. Mr. Milzer's um, analyzing that, um, but we, he, I know that he had expressed to me that he wants to bring that to you in an organized manner and in relationship to our budget and the one that you will actually approve. Um, Mr. Milzer, are you still on the call? Yes. It, would you like to add to that or clarify that further? Uh, I think what you said is, is exactly right. Uh, I didn't hear the original question, but uh, at this point, there's really only a few things we know for certain and we're keeping an eye on what's going on at the state level as well as the federal level. Um, some districts, especially districts that uh, may be in a bind financially or have something else going on that's affecting their finances, have kind of jumped out front and said, oh, what if, what if it's really bad? Uh, maybe we should make uh, some cuts immediately or cuts for next year or whatever, but it's, all of that is based on conjecture on what the level of funding would be, how it would change in the future. Uh, there's a question of whether it would change next year or whether it would change for the biennium uh, for 21 to 23. So we're looking at all of that very closely, but there isn't any concrete information out there right now on what's going to happen. Um, Mr. Milzer, the budget, um please remind me, would be presented the preliminary budget to the board in June, correct? Yes. I will continue to provide you um, information and links to information about what is they're speculating in terms of what how this will impact the budget. Um, I mean, overall, I think you know, there's a lot of speculation about the economy in general and how we're going to respond to this. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing the impact that this will have. And as I talk about it, it's, it's something that will, like ripples in a pond, it will, it will ripple out for some time to come. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to provide a, any information I receive about what potentially will be happening with funding for education. I guess my question really wasn't about the future, it's more about what has happened in our district in the last month, or what's, where are we spending money, where are we not spending money? I see. So nothing? Um, could you speak that into your mic, please? Uh, okay. It would just be a little easier. Yeah, my question is not really the future, but what has happened in the last couple months? What, where are we spending money, where are we not spending money, where we normally would? Just some basic parameters on that. The question was where where are we spending money now and where are we not spending money? Did I hear it correctly? Yes, you did. Uh, and we don't need to talk about this now. Money, really, according to our budget at this point, we aren't we aren't a district that needed to run out and buy a lot of things uh, to make our virtual learning happen. Uh, so we had all of the equipment that we needed for students. It just needed to be distributed. Um, so we haven't, we haven't bought a lot of things to make this happen or needed to go beyond our regular budget as some districts did to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get some devices in the students' hands. Um, now we're certainly um, saving money in, in areas where we're not uh, in the building so much and so forth. I don't have any numbers to that. Um, but we, we, at the end of this year, will certainly come in uh, farther under budget than we would have otherwise if this would not have happened. It's not, it's not costing us extra money at this point. And our history of having um, 
an excellent fund balance and planning for the future is paying off in a situation like this where uh, we don't have to uh, run out and make quick decisions and um, maybe do some rash things or, or, or change things immediately uh, because of what might happen. Uh, we're in a great position financially uh, and we're able to watch and see what's going to happen and react to it and we'll be planning in the meantime but for this year we're, we're doing um, better than we would have we're saving additional dollars thank you i'm looking for a motion to adjourn <clears throat> so moved. Um, motion by mrs larson second by mrs witkowski all in favor say aye aye, aye. Opposed? Uh, motion carries. We are adjourned at 7.15 p.m.